but before that so so I will use a data set and um, actually the details of the data set are not that important because I will uh, mostly focus on um, uh, motion correction, not like estimating HRF, uh, but it's good to just give you an idea. Um, so we have this frontal probe and we have these um, channels uh, that are shown in purple. Reds are sources and blues are detectors. So this is our probe design. And then the task is, <coughs> so uh, there are two conditions here. There is a rest um, uh, condition, or maybe it's not called a condition, but there's rest for 20 seconds. And then for condition one, participants uh, walk on straight through um, cones at um, two kilometers per hour. And then uh, there's another um, uh, condition, uh, which is the second condition, uh, where participants uh, walk around cones. Uh, and here is the picture of it. Um, and so uh, it's expected that the second condition will result in a higher uh, activation than the first condition. And that's the only thing we want to get from this. Like, if you look at HRF, we will expect, uh, we expect higher activation in the second condition. Just to uh, summarize that. Okay, so let me open MATLAB. Um, okay. I want to go to Homer tree first. So this is uh, this should be a habit if you're using uh, if you want to use Homer tree always do set pads. Oh, actually before that, I actually forgot. I first want to talk about Homer tree. Um, okay, sorry about that. It, it's good we first talk about it and then use it, right? Um, so um, Homer tree, it's based on Homer two. Homer two mostly developed by David Boas, Ted Hopper, and J-Dub. And Homer tree is mostly uh, J-Dub is um, developing. And um, this is uh, the GitHub page uh, for Homer tree. Everyone can um, download it. And also uh, I highly recommend, um, we have been using GitHub for the last um, two years or not two years, but less than two years. Um, there is a GitHub desktop application, so you can have it and then easily update uh, Homer tree in your uh, local um, um, directories uh, using that application. Um, and we also have a wiki there. Of course, wiki is right now that not that much major, but we are working on it. We have a, a PhD student, uh, Yele. She's uh, working on putting you know, stuff in there, um, so it will uh, build up in time. Okay, so Homer tree, uh, of course, as you all know, is a MATLAB application uh, used for analyzing FNIRS data to estimate brain activation. And it's a continuation of the work uh, on Homer to software, uh, but uh, there are uh, several, several important advancements and uh, some new features there. Um, and I will uh, simply uh, summarize a couple of them. So now we have with Homer tree, we have explicit support for uh, group and subject level analysis. Um, and they, these are um, these allow flexible and configurable group and subject level analysis um, support using the same uh, mechanism as run level analysis. So now you, um, in Homer tree too, if you have uh, been using it, um, so you have this option um, to um, um, edit um, or um, add different functions on the run level, but Homer tree will allow you to add uh, functions on the subject level or group level, um, maybe like different statistical methods or uh, such. Right now, we really don't have too much functions on the group and subject level. Uh, we just added uh, the uh, functions for the run level from Homer two, uh, but it will develop. Um, <coughs> so one nice feature um, in Homer tree is user-defined functions. 
So um, adding functions to the processing stream now does not require code chains uh, to the core uh, Homer 3 code, uh, but it did for Homer 2. So what we mean by this is you can simply write your code, your, your, your own function, whatever you need. You may need a statistical test, for instance, or you want to add a different motion correction, right? Uh, so you want to have this function. The most critical thing is, and um, I think, um, yeah, I plan to show you guys maybe an example, but I, I won't go into detail. But the most important thing here is you will have to write the help section on the code itself. And that help section, of course, have to follow some uh, rules that uh, we predefined. And then uh, whenever Homer 3 launches, uh, it will go through this function, reads this help section, and it will actually parse the inputs and outputs of that function. This is pretty cool um, uh, functionality. And you have to put that function in a certain uh, directory. It's, uh, I can also show it to you when I uh, go to Homer 3, but it's uh, under function registry slash user functions. When you put in there, Homer 3 will automatically detect all the functions uh, under this folder and look at the help sections and read it and then they will uh, automatically ab appear in the processing uh, stream GUI. So the, the GUI that you add different functions, right, it will automatically appear there. Um, uh, one other um, <coughs> Uh, one other thing uh, that came with uh, actually not uh, not with Homer tree, but this was something that the FNIRS community uh, was discussing for a long while. You know, coming up with a standard uh, format for like all the commercial systems would have the same um, output, so that we can easily use it, and with, uh, with different softwares, we'll be able to load this, uh, etc. So SNRF uh, is a shared near infrared spectroscope format. Um, so uh, now Homer 3 has the ability to read and write SNRF uh, 5 format. And we hope that uh, in time, um, more and more uh, FNIR software will adapt this, as well as uh, commercial devices uh, will adapt this format. So it will, we, will, we will be able to share a data and use our own software, uh, et cetera. Uh, much more easily. So this is the link for um, the SNRF. It also has its uh, GitHub uh, site. Um, okay, what I'm saying is uh, here, let's see, okay, a universal file format for storing and sharing and your data independently of any specific application. So that's um, the SNRF. So Homer 3 also provides a nearest class object, which is able to read and write Homer 2 style. For instance, if you have a nearest file, so you collected this uh, much before uh, SNRF was there or um, uh, your, yeah, your, your uh, device is uh, saving in the nearest format, then it can uh, read this nearest and create a SNRF file. Um, also, um, the modular uh, object-oriented design of Homer 3 allows reader writers of other formats to be easily added and exported to uh, SNR format. So right now it's only in years, but um, um, in the future, um, of course, we will need to adapt different uh, conversions. So one other feature of uh, Homer 3 is <coughs> that it keeps your data intact. Uh, what I mean by that is Homer 3 does not change the original files. Um, it uses um, a an analysis. It separates the data in, into acquired and uh, derived. And all, all process data is stored in a separate group is also mad. And uh, I don't know if you have ever experienced, but sometimes it may happen that um, during the analysis, your data can get corrupted and you cannot use it anymore. Um, so this is kind of a safety uh, thing. So right now, uh, if you use Homer 3, it's not gonna change anything in the SNRF files, but we'll create a group results.mat file like Homer 2 did uh, to save the uh, process data. Okay. And 
uh, degree, we can say it's clearer, simpler GUI interface compared to Homer 2, but you guys need to test it, of course. Um, and it, it has enough similarity so that one can easily adapt from Homer 2 to 3. So it, it's not like you have to figure out where what, where is what. So it will be very easy. If you have been using Homer 2, it will be really easy to switch um, to um, Homer 3. Um, I think this is the last slide about Homer 3. It uses a simple and understandable object-oriented software design. And uh, this allows it to be more easily modified and extended. And it consists of five independent GUIs. And these are the same as Homer 2. It has the main GUI that that's the one when you launch it appear, uh, it pops up. There's STEM edit GUI <coughs> in which, um, you know, we can add uh, STEM marks or name the conditions uh, of the of the stims or label the stims. Um, there's a plot pro, this is a display uh, GUI um, that you can look at um, the hemodynamic response on all channels um, at the same time. Uh, there is a prox stream edit GUI uh, in which if you launch it, you can add different functions, remove different functions. And uh, finally, you have Prog Stream Options GUI, and that's where you um, you input the parameters for the functions you have chosen in Prog Stream. Okay, um, now I am going back to MATLAB. Okay, so just what I was saying is, um, yeah, two things before I. Um, actually launch Homer 3. Um, so what I was talking about, like I, I said, there is this help section. Um, and so this is a Homer function, Homer 3 function. Uh, by the way, uh, now uh, we use this uh, notation. If a function is a run level function, we put an R. It's going to be HMRR. If it's a session level, it's an a HMRS. And it, if it's um, um, a group level function is maybe HMR G. I'm not sure about G right now, but um, yeah, this is for instance a session level uh, function. You have so this help is important, and this is uh, parsed by Homer. So it has like it has the syntax. You have to give the syntax uh, of the uh, function inputs and outputs, um, and you have um, uh, different. Um, uh, I, you can have different options, and uh, here it it's, it doesn't have, but you may have like, um, if you have like user inputs, you also define them here. It says parameters, and it will automatically read these. So these are the default default values, for instance, for baseline range, and you will see it on like on your proc uh, stream uh, edit GUI uh, or, or options GUI. Okay, so. So what we do first is when we open Homer 3, we want to do set paths. Don't forget to do that. This is not a MATLAB function. MATLAB function is set path. This is set paths is a Homer function. <coughs> um, so I will go back uh, to uh, my data set, yeah, so this is, uh, it has, um, this is a Nirex data, but it's converted into NIRS. Uh, but when we open Homer 3, uh, this NIRS uh, file uh, will be converted into a SNR file. Um, let's see if it actually does it properly. By the way, now this is, uh, if you're uh, like uh, first opening, first launching Homer 3, it will, um, if you recall, I mentioned this registry or uh, function registry. It will go through that um, uh, folder and check each function and, and will read e each function. <coughs> so see, it says parsing HMR underscore GLM. Because I, just to show you guys, I deleted the registry file. So it, it's doing it again, like going through all the functions and parsing them. Mm 
but when you launch it again it shouldn't be doing this parsing again it should be only on the first time you launch it as you see it looks uh, very similar to homer 2 so you, i don't think you will have any issue if you were using um, homer 2 before so now it says homer 3 did not find any snurf files in the current folder but did find a dot nearest file do you want to convert to dot nearest files yes we want to do that <coughs> so now if you look at my directory here um, there is this new file has been generated um, that snare file okay i think it's still doing something otherwise we would see the data oops okay i'll just load the um, default uh, config file which is the default um, processing stream um, okay so um, this is the auxiliary channel um, this data set has um, an accelerometer data so this is an accelerometer data uh, so I'm just going to unclick that and uh, show um, some nearest uh, channels, basically. Just, I think, slow. Okay, so we are looking at row uh, signal. Let me check the options. Um, so you can go to this edit options to check what options you have. Um, so I, I, I'm really not going to go into details here because we are focused on motion artifacts. So this has low coverage here. It doesn't have a GLM. Um, I'm just going to change it to 30 because um, this, the rest, um, I mean, the stimulus duration was 20 seconds. I just give it another 10 seconds for the it have to go down. I will just run this to see if everything is uh, running well, and then we will go to edit um, process stream and then add our, our motion correction algorithms and test each of them. Okay, it seems to be working. Um, um, I'm just going to see how it looks like. Oh, I, I have to I have to choose href here and then we'll just look at the results. Now this is very small. I'm just gonna make them bigger. Okay, so this is condition one and you can pick different conditions here, the second condition looks like this okay and now i want to see let me close this one um let's look at here for instance or here so here um if you're familiar with uh, looking at your data, you can see that these are probably due to motion, these fast change. They don't look like typical uh, hemodynamic response. Okay, so I will go to optical density. So we have like, we can easily see where we are at. So we have these large motions here, uh, spikes. I'm gonna fix this window. So when we correct anything, we know how much we correct it. So our eyes are not pulled. Um, okay, so I'm gonna fix this window. Um, by the way, so the blues are the first condition and the reds are, are the second condition. If you're wondering what are these uh, vertical bars are. Let me close this one. Okay, um, so yeah, I go to tools and I go to edit processing stream.
Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to add um, emotion um, detection algorithm. So we have two of these, and the difference is um, so this will, we will be able to see um, um, emotion artifacts um, at each channel. Um, so I'm just going to add that. And then I will add, like, so this is. Um, this is the hybrid method I was talking about. Let's add that one. Let's add the spline. Um, we discussed um, what else we discussed. PCA recurs is the TPCA targeted pre PCA. Let's add that one. Um, and wait, wait, let's add that one too. Okay. Uh, and then I'm just going to keep the rest as, as they are uh, for now. And I add that to the current processing stream. OK, now I will exit this window and check if my, my new functions are here, um, which seems they are. So first of all, uh, I'm going so each of these um, Correction methods, they have um, a turn on of um, parameter. I'm just going to set all of them to zero first so we don't do any correction. Um, but just look at uh, the, the detection of motion artifacts. So I just um, turn off all the corrections right now. Um, OK, so let me do the same for this one. OK, for uh, for motion detection, I will put 20. Um, let's try 0 0.05 here. Let's see what happens if it captures too much or not. OK, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna click uh, show excluded auto. Okay. Seems it's a little overdoing it. You see, uh, well, I don't see any motion artifact here. I don't know why it's also capturing that. Let me loosen it so that I only have uh, the standard deviation as the criteria, basically. Let me try that. Okay, so yeah, this is not ideal either. So we missed this one, um, but we captured a couple of them. Um, so for instance, if that's the case, um, definitely uh, spline cannot correct this one, right? Has, you have to capture all of, the, all of those. So we can play with the parameters so that we capture a um, good amount of them. Okay. Um, so, let me go. Okay. Don't hit this. Okay. I'll just try one more. I don't want to lose time uh, with that, but let's maybe we find something in between. Okay, not really. Um, okay, so I will now go back and, for instance, turn on um, spline SG. So this is um, what it is doing is a hybrid method. It's doing the spline interpolate. So first of all, it it finds different types of motion artifacts uh, instead of like assigning uh, every single change in the signal as motion artifact. It assigns it finds the baseline shift type and it finds the uh, spike type and it corrects the spikes with wavelet or uh, not with wavelet with Savitsky coli, which is similar to wavelet but it's faster. Uh, and it corrects the baseline shifts uh, with spline interpolation because it's it's really good at that. 
Um, let's see what it does here. Okay, so uh, Mariam, can I can yeah. I just ask a question? Sorry to interrupt, because it, it has since you're exactly there. Uh, I I wanted to ask a question that has been brought up by by several people. Yeah. Uh, we noticed that the default values, for example, for the PPF and for the cutoff frequencies, look different uh, to what they looked in Homer two. Uh, for example, we see one one zero one zero for PPF, mm -hmm, and it is mm -hmm. three six, and also the the low pass and high pass um, frequencies look different. So what's the reason behind? Um, so I guess the low, like high pass is the same. Low pass, was it three? I think it was three hertz. Yes. So it, yes, it wasn't exactly. doing anything. And exactly. like we were always doing like correcting it with 0 0.5. So mm -hmm. it's like an extra work. Um, if you want to correct for um, heartbeat, uh, you have to go a little below one hertz. Mm -hmm. Not cleaning much. So we just made it as default. Uh, for, for this one one is um, is a different thing of course and it's a, it's a great question that you brought it up so now we are actually not correcting for uh, pad length factor so we, we mm -hmm. had this six and six here right uh, you recall that exactly. um, and that was in centimeters so you we were correcting it and so when we report um, our HRF um, so dimensions was in molar but now we are not doing any any correction um so that like our results will be um molar times um length or or centimeter so so that mm -hmm. will affect that how we report the results and um and um yeah we discussed this with david and the idea was that um this will be telling that we actually don't know the true um uh, correction factors um and so when we report um we are gonna, you know, instead of saying, you know, we just assumed this value and we corrected for that, we are just uh, gonna report uncorrected values. So, mm -hmm. in terms of like um, statistical analysis and such, it's not gonna change anything because, for instance, you're comparing two conditions, right? It will only um, multiply each condition by a constant value, so it will not mm -hmm. change anything relative. Uh, but it's just going to change the uh, the values of hemodynamic response function. So it, it's going to be larger now. Rather, mm -hmm. like in Homer 2, you will be probably you're used to much lower values. But because we are not doing this correction, the values will be much larger. And how we report will be changed. Like uh, mm -hmm. we are not going to report in molar, but in molar times the length. Mm -hmm. Okay, but one may still you want to um, use yes. different values, and then you can okay. definitely. Okay. Yeah, it will work if you have if you know you can still put six six or if you know even better like you have for your age group you have mm -hmm. values from literature definitely you can use it and it will work. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, um, so so now I'm gonna turn this off and I'm gonna put one here. And I think this will be a good example because oh first of all actually I want to go back. Um, so let's go back and then we can see the effect. So now I'm going to go back to uncorrected version. <coughs> okay. And then apply um, spline. Um, it will be good to see um, that it's probably correct these ones because they're detected, but we didn't detect these ones. So it is not going to do anything on that. So that's something we have to be careful. Just take that lesson. Yeah, so I think it corrected this one, but this one is still, I mean, I, I think the amplitude got reduced uh, a little bit. But these ones, just because they're not captured, right? If it's not captured, spline cannot do anything. So it's not like spline's fault. It's our fault uh, that we didn't detect properly. Um, okay. Um, and the other method was this targeted PCA, applying um, PCA on the parts of the data that's contaminated uh, by motion artifacts. Oh, 
Okay, so kind of did some nice job there. Um, okay, we had one more. Oh, by the way, I think I didn't add CBSI, mm, but if you want to add, you want to add it after optical density concentration because uh, that's applied on concentration not optical density as opposed to the rest uh, of the motion correction methods it has to be after um, optical density concentration um, okay i'm gonna try wavelet now it's a little slower but we should be fine um, And after this, we can look at um, uh, hemodynamic response results like HPR and HPR uh, with and without correction. <coughs> As I said, it's kind of uh, slower than the other methods. Um, but if you really want to do this, you can leave it overnight, like if you have many data. And especially for this function to work, um, you need to do the, that set paths because it's creating a math file that is used by this function. So if you didn't do that, it will ask you this db2.math is, is not there or something like that, you'll get the message. So you, you have to do set paths uh, before this function can work. Also, some of you are asking, I get these questions, like some of these are not working when you don't have the proper MATLAB toolboxes. So make sure you you have them. I don't know, um, it's like definitely signal processing, but maybe there are others uh, that you have to have for these functions to properly work. Okay, and that was um, blind um, uh, wavelet correction. By the way, we still have red patches because I only detect before any correction. I don't detect after. So if you add this um, motion artifact by channel, um, like this detection function after the correction, again, uh, these uh, red patches should disappear. So I'm going to go back and turn this off and run it again and then maybe now we can look at um, HRF. <coughs> okay now the Y range is, is not good so I'm going to change it. Um, so as Lamia said now like uh, because of this PPA, we didn't co correct for PP PPF. Now these values are much larger than what we are used to in, in Homer, Homer 2. So this is without correction. Um, and we suspect that this could be due to uh, motion artifacts. So now uh, we are going to look, um, Just I'm just going to turn on this one and rerun it and let's see how much um, it, it uh, cleans um, the HBO or HRF. It's kind of cleaned. Uh, let me look at plot probe. Okay, this is... Um, of course, it's harder to um, have an idea here. I will all, I, I, we didn't look at before, right? Or we, I guess we did. Um, I'm just going to check it again before correction. But right now it looks good. It looks smooth, um, but maybe um it didn't look that 
smooth before. I want to check that. It shouldn't because there are motion effects. Okay, so now I go back, plot probe. Of course, we didn't correct for all motions, so it shouldn't, it, we could still have stuff here and there. Okay, so you see like this channel, I think we were looking at this. These are due to motion and maybe like these are also due to motion. Maybe we have some stuff here and there. I think they disappeared um, when we, after the correction. My, um, my like display is quite small, so I cannot really show both of them at the same time. But if you guys can, when you guys have the data set, please try it. But like definitely, uh, I think these were, got much cleaner after uh, the correction. Okay, so I think that's, um, I want to switch back to my slides and let's see. It's good that I also have time to talk about um, this new approach. Um, <coughs> let's make this bigger. So we have recently introduced this uh, new method. It's GLM, General Linear Model, with temporally embedded uh, canonical correlation analysis. Um, just take it as a sneak peek, uh, but the details are published um, in, in, uh, in, in NeuroImage uh, 2020. Uh, and we are now working on adding this uh, functionality in Homer tree. So it should be there in Homer tree soon. Um, so before going to the GLM with TCCA, um, just a reminder on uh, what GLM is um, before you know jumping into TCA GLM. Um, so we have these um, nearest measurements uh, which contain different components, right? Uh, different uh, sources. Uh, it has the brain activation that we want to extract. It also may have systemic interference. Um, motion artifacts, um, slow drifts, etc. many things, uh, but what we, we get the resultant near signal. We don't know uh, which part of his brain activation, which part of is that, which part of is this. But uh, when we have a prior knowledge of uh, any of these components, we can model them. Uh, for instance, if we have an accelerometer data, uh, which is an independent measure of motion artifacts, we can use it uh, to model motion artifacts in the signal. Uh, or for instance, if you have a short separation channel, um, if you recall, short separation channel is, um, they're like less than a centimeter uh, source detector separation. And so that it doesn't go through the brain, but it only goes through the scalp. So you can actually model the systemic interference uh, using uh, short separation channels. So, as I said, if you have a priori knowledge, uh, we can do all these also for, for HRF, right? If we know, for instance, from fMRI uh, or other literature, the shape of the HRF, we can also model that. And there are different models for HRF. So the advantage of GLM is that uh, modeling of each of these and simultaneously estimating a weight for each component, or we can call them regressor, uh, it results in a more uh, correct estimation of hemodynamic response because now you're uh, taking into consideration all these things and your prior knowledge about all these things. And especially if you have an independent measure of all these things, right? Accelerometer is an independent measure of motion artifact and uh, short separation um, channel signal can be considered as an independent measure of uh, systemic uh, change in the scalp, right? Um, so then you can really get a more accurate estimate of um, hemodynamic uh, response function. So it finds the best fit uh, that results in a minimum error between your measurements and this model. So you, you model this, you add up all these components and you have measurements on, on the other side and you look at the difference. And uh, what GLM does is um, it, it tries to um, get the minimum error. <laughs> so 
so um, what does GLM with TCCA do? Um, in, in one sentence, I'm just going to read it. Uh, by the way, um, this is um, um, if you want to read uh, the papers in published in NeuroImage uh, very recently. So GLM with TCCA, I'm just going to read this, is an extension of, of GLM uh, that incorporates TCA with temporal embedding uh, using multiple axillary channels, whether we have accelerometer, uh, FNIRS, uh, short separation channels, or blood pressure, respiration, it can be anything. Uh, and it gets, it, it um, creates uh, optimal nuisance regressors um, for, um, for the supervised generating model. Here, uh, temporal embedding is a, is a critical word. Uh, let me first explain that. <coughs> Up to now, when we look at these uh, motion um, detection algorithms, right, we detect motion artifacts directly from the FNIR signal. How about if we had an independent measure of motion like an accelerometer, uh, which is a great thing, um, then one we'll, would we'll expect that the first thing you would expect is that any signal change in accelerometer will result in a signal change in FNIR's um, signal as well, and at the exact same time. But it's not the case. Um, so it's not ideal to use an accelerometer data as one of the regressors in our JLM the way it is. We see in actual data that sometimes um, the artifact appears uh, with a certain delay in the nearest signal. And even more, this delay is not the same for each artifact. So it can be um, half a second for one artifact or 0.2 seconds for another artifact. So that delay can also vary. Also consider systemic change in scope. Um, there can be a certain uh, lag or delay between them and the change um, in the brain signal. So it's not, again, um, optimal uh, to use a short separation channel as a regressor uh, without considering this. And one solution to this is uh, temporal embedding. Uh, you can simply shift the signal you have, um, for instance, an accelerometer signal, and obtain many regressors from the same signal uh, uh, with same information, but uh, they are delayed versions. And here uh, comes the canonical correlation analysis. Uh, on one side, you have your FNIR signal uh, long, long separation measurements, which has uh, the brain activation plus all these other things. And on the other side, you have your axillary measurements be it uh, accelerometer, short separation regression, and any other things. And they are time-shifted versions because you did this temporal embedding. And CCA finds, um, finds a linear combination uh, of these two sets that, max, uh, that maximizes the correlation between these two uh, data sets, between um, your long separation channels and the rest of you know, the, the, all the auxiliary channels. And they are time-shifted versions. And the linear set that you get from the auxiliary set is now your new regressor. Um, so now, so this is the like the previous uh, figure I have shown the GLM that uses only. Um, so here you have long separation channels and uh, you have short separation channels that you feed into GLM. Uh, you you may have. Uh, a model for HRF and definitely the onset time. Uh, and you may model your drifts with a polynomial and you get your hemodynamic response. So now, instead of inputting um, directly the short separation channel as it is, it, in, it inputs this new regressor into the GLM. And um, so it could be, um, so here um, in this paper, we had blood pressure, PPG, respiration, accelerometer, and short separation, and we lumped all of them. We uh, shifted them in time, like we did temporal embedding, and we found the regressors uh, using a uh, um, uh, canonical correlation analysis. And then that regressors we used uh, in, in the GLM instead of you know, directly using a short separation channel or directly using an accelerometer channel signal. We used uh, those as regressor in, in GLM to clean the rest of the things happening in the signal. Um, we, of course, tested um, whether this new idea is better than the conventional GLM with short separation regression. 
Uh, we had a data set from uh, 14 subjects. This was a <coughs> all resting state uh, data set. We had nearest measurements with uh, long and short separation channels, as well as, as I said, uh, blood pressure, respiration, PPG, and accelerometer signals. And what we did is, um, as I've described, um, how we compare different motion correction methods. Uh, we added a synthetic HRF to data and then estimated HRF using each method. And as an evaluation metric, uh, we used um, root mean squared error, correlation, and F-score. Um, okay, so these are uh, the summary of uh, our uh, comparison results. Um, and so here on top, you see um, the uh, um, results for oxyhemoglobin and bottom uh, for deoxyhemoglobin. And so x-axis is always here uh, showing the results from GLM with short separation regression, and the y-axis is always a GLM uh, using a regressive from uh, TCCA. And as you can see, um, correlation um, is always a higher. Uh, this correlation, just to remind you, we are looking at uh, estimated HRF using um, these methods versus uh, the true HRF. It's always like comparing uh, our results with uh, true HRF. So it, we are, um, the TCC at GLM was doing much better in terms of correlation. It had much higher correlation uh, compared to GLM with short separation regression. Also, um, we look at a root mean squared error uh, and we get reduced uh, error when we use um, GLM with uh, TCCA. And we also had this F-score, F-score value. Um, and so um, we also, uh, um, TCA GLM was also doing uh, better um, uh, in terms of uh, F-score. Um, this is just summarizing uh, overall. Um, a TCCA with GLM improves upon GLM with short separation regression um, by like 45% uh, in correlation uh, by a reduction uh, in R RNSC uh, by 55% and we got a threefold increase in um, F score. <coughs> by the way, um, I didn't explain F score, but I mean, you can, of course, Google it, or maybe you already know it, but it, it like it's um, looking at all these, you know, true positive, false positive, how how well we did, uh, you know, in this those type of uh, stuff. So we didn't add HRF to all channels. We added on on certain channels so that we can look at other channels that didn't have HRF and see if we have like false positives there as well. So uh, this was kind of a sanity check, like looking at everything that can go wrong. Okay, um, so one question that will come to mind is um, um, is which auxiliary modalities to choose, right? So we, so you, you cannot really have all these <coughs> auxiliary measurements all the time. Uh, this was a huge uh, study, right? You have all these things attached to a subject and you calibrate all of them. It takes time. You want everything to work out well. So it's, it's not really like something you can always do, especially like for different populations, for an infant or a kid, they can't really wait uh, that long or, uh, or a patient. Um, some patient groups, they're um, less likely to wait uh, that amount, amount of time. So you want to have this optimal set of um, auxiliary measurements that can give us uh, the same performance or at least a similar performance as uh, we have um, uh, without um, them. Um, so we look at uh, our evaluation metrics again. Again, you see correlation, uh, RMSC, and F-score <coughs> by using different uh, combinations of our axillary measurements and compared it uh, with results using uh, all of those measurements. So here, for instance, uh, a percent a reduction here means um, a, a reduction in the improvement in that metric. Um, in short, um, here um, uh, we concluded that 
a short separation and accelerometer uh, would suffice and give us uh, very similar uh, improvements uh, when we use all of them. Uh, for instance, um, here it means so correlation, um, in correlation, if you use only uh, short separation channels and accelerometer uh, as our you know, regressors uh, in TCCA GLM, uh, we will have only 7% decrease in our improvement that we get using all of them. And similarly, uh, for RMSC, we have 5% um, uh, decrease, and for F score is 4%. And these, uh, by the way, sorry, uh, all these top ones are for HBO uh, estimation, and all the uh, bottom ones are for HBR estimation. So for HBR estimation, we have like 4% reduction and 4% reduction in correlation and RMSC. And uh, for the F score, we actually did not see a difference. Okay, I think that was uh, my last slide. Um, yeah, I got help uh, from these guys uh, when making my slides. So I just wanted to thank them as well. Um, okay. Hello. Hey, hi. Thank you very hi. much for your for your presentation. Uh, we get we get a lot of a lot of people again thanking you a lot um, for your welcome. time. And we do have a lot of questions. Uh, again, we won't be able to answer uh, all of them, but we will do our best, and we will uh, follow up all the questions later on. Uh, so we have actually one question still of. Um, talking about the block average function. So uh, we'd like to know how is the baseline in the block average function uh, determined and uh, why, why is, is it in this way? So in the, in the um, homework tree. Yeah. Um, so um, so we, I think we default have minus two there. Um, so the only thing you have to be careful about is um, I mean, you don't want to go um, um, to um, um, to um, well. Maybe I will just show it. Um, you don't want to go too close to the pre preceding um, hemodynamic response. Um, you don't. You want it to be as clean right. baseline as possible. That's um, that's what I was gonna say actually. Uh, I right. don't know if I need to show it here, but um, I thought it would be easier. Um, yeah. Um, uh, for instance, uh, in this case, uh, we had um, a stimulus from um, a stimulus duration of 20 seconds, and I added like 30 seconds. So you will you will have a you know a response increasing and then decreasing and so you don't want to include that part of the HRF from the preceding in your baseline. So you want this HRF to have a um, have a clean as clean baseline as possible, not like contaminated by the uh, change in uh, in the signal due to the uh, preceding stimulus. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. just one, one, one correction that I forgot. Um, so about the, the data set, uh, I believe we, we might made a, a confusion because we, we sent you two data sets. One okay. of them were, were, were 20 seconds and with someone doing the, you know, walking. And then we send the second one, which is just finger tapping. It's actually for 10 seconds. I believe that's the one you are, you are showing there. Oh, oh, so maybe oh, that's okay. why you so saw we really some kind of, yeah, so <laughs> oh, maybe that's, that's why. why Okay. Yes. Okay, I guess that's the, that's why. So I'm sorry if there was some confusion no, no, no. there. No, no, no. It's really good uh, that you brought okay. it up. Yeah, it, it looked really. Um, there were like three things happening at the same time. So we just yeah. maybe put it 15 here instead of like 30. Yeah. So maybe. I'm, that's I'm just now curious. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no you problem. Can go ahead. Question. Yeah. So yeah, th this is the uh, just just so everyone knows. Also, this is the data set that we will we will make it available for you uh, afterwards. It's a uh, finger tapping, uh, ten seconds uh, stimuli. Okay. 
So, so they were uh, finger like they were tapping their fingers and then walking, like how the, or maybe move their heads for the uh, moving. moving the head. Yes, yes. So yeah. we yes, we try to do some uh, artificial motion artifacts, so it mm -hmm. will be easier to see. Um, yeah, yeah. You know the motion artifacts in, on the data. Okay. Yeah, that looks more like a. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we can go to the second question then. Uh, so, uh, still about the um, um, the channels. So, how the channels can be manually uh, excluded or deleted in the Homer three? Is that a possibility? So. Um, unless we forgot to put it there. I mean, that's very possible. Um, not all the functionality is there right now, but. Um, Um, yeah, maybe we don't have it right now because I exclude time. Is it this one? No, that's just going to exclude time, not the, just the stem. Yeah, that, that's something I think we need to add. Maybe it's, it's missing and it's, it's really good. Like, um, you guys can write it. We have, um, a Google group, uh, for Homer. So, and you, you're gonna notice a lot of things that are missing probably. <laughs> and it will be good like if you let us know uh, what is missing there from Homer 2 that you like to use. Um, but this should be uh, definitely something to be added. I, I didn't see it. Oh, great, this is really good. We will send all the, the questions uh, for you also later so you can, you mm -hmm. can have this. Uh, thank you. Um, um, Milen, would you like to, to make the next question? Yes, actually, Lamia, do you want to ask two of your questions and then mm -hmm. we will, because the, the um, participant questions are pouring in right now. So, yeah, <laughs> I know. We're having a hard time to get yes. everything. Yes, uh, I have my favorite topic, which I know Mariam is also a topic that you studied a lot, which are the Meyer waves. And I and we did not talk a lot about uh, Meyer waves today, but I wanted and I'm always curious, what is the best method maybe besides short channels to remove Meyer waves and whether is it correct just to filter them out? I know some people simply put zero one hertz as filter cutoff frequency. And mm -hmm. it doesn't actually, uh, I, you know, we know that F near's frequency band is 0 0.1, so you're always afraid to remove it, but it actually does not remove the response, it just removes the double peak. So mm -hmm. what is mm -hmm. your favorite method of, your best method as we thought yeah. before? <laughs> yeah, my favorite method is not filtering, <laughs> that's for <laughs> sure. Um, especially if um, uh, the evoked hemodynamic response you're expecting is within the same range, frequency range as mm -hmm. the Mayer wave, mm -hmm. and which is typically the case. So you will be also remo removing mm -hmm. the brain activation. Um, uh, so yeah, definitely short separation, uh, regression. Uh, but before that, uh, I think um, the first thing we need to do is mm -hmm. uh, to be careful when we are actually designing our experiments. Um, so if we have this um, design that like we have the same um, interstimulus interval, like mm -hmm. uh, maybe the one we had. Um, so then it's very easy that, you know, systemic physiology can be locked with Mayer wave and whatever we see or mm -hmm. the brain activation can be locked with uh, Mayer wave. And then what we see as average is just an average of Mayer waves. And we don't know that that's a false positive. So it has to be jittered or, or, or randomized so that um, mm -hmm. we actually get rid of them um, or plan uh, even before uh, to get mm -hmm. rid of uh, the and, and uh, that's that's typically not the case right people always use most of the time it's multiple of tens right 10 yeah. seconds for the for this yes, or 20 yes. like, like we did for example <laughs> yeah. especially like the 10 second thing is right that's the mayor wave yes uh, yes, yes exactly exactly yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do I have Milan time for one more or uh, would you go ahead with, um, okay. Ah, uh, so I was, you, you showed us how to treat short channel data and for example, additional regressors sorry, accelerometry. So what about, uh, there are many other regressors that, uh, that could be used like uh, respiration, for example, galvanic skin response or anything. So is there any signal in particular that has been proven either from a biological point of view or statistical point of view, for example, frequency, uh, more powerful than other to remove physiological noise from, from the FNIR signal? Yeah, um, so um, maybe um, going back to my mm -hmm. um, last slide. 
Um, so this is uh, this is not just showing the the improvement in in you know uh, due to motion artifact correction, right? This mm -hmm. includes everything. This is also including the removal of uh, systemic physiology uh, with short mm -hmm. separation mm -hmm. regression. Um, so uh, and um, as you said, we may have all these measurements, and so that's why actually we did this um, to answer your question. We did this mm -hmm. analysis. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, we ended up. Uh, concluding that just using short separation uh, channels, uh, and these are, uh, of course, uh, just to note that it's not a single short separation channel, but this is like a short separation channel um, close to each source or as much as mm -hmm. possible. It's not mm -hmm. like, because um, systemic uh, chains are not also homogenous across um, the scalp. And also mm -hmm. the accelerometer, those two uh, were doing quite well. Um, so, um, yeah, we conclude we can just keep uh, those two, but not like, of course, if you have a chance, you can use all of them, but it's maybe it's not mm -hmm. worth having all of them if you don't mm -hmm. have, you know, mm -hmm. that much time. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not getting you much more improvements. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You. You're welcome. Okay, next question. And I would like to say thank you for everybody who's here, despite the OSA and asking great question. So next question, um, can short separation channels be removed in simple block average function? Which is the best function in Homer 3 to remove the short separation contamination? Yeah, um, block average right now, no. Like the block average function is literally taking the, like the concentration signal and those time periods, those blocks, and summing them and dividing them by the number of trials, that's the only thing it's doing. So you need to uh, use um, general linear model. And we have a function HMR underscore GLM uh, in, in Homer 3 uh, that gives you um, the option to uh, remove short separation, um, do, doing the short separation regression. And it also has a couple of options. Um, so you can either use the short separation that has the highest correlation with the long separation at hand, or it can use the nearest uh, neighbor short separation uh, to clean the long, or you can average all the short separations in the probe and use that as a regressor for all the uh, long separation channels. And uh, we, uh, we have this uh, um, feature in Homer 3 and as well as in Homer 2, you can mouse over, hover over with your mouse on, on any uh, function in the processing, um, like the uh, options uh, GUI, and it will give you all these options and explanation for all these and what parameters can be can you use for those. And it has many other options. Um, I'm not going into detail because of the time, but it has options for using different um, hemodynamic response models, like the gamma modified gamma or just the more flexible models, um, consecutive Gaussians, etc. Okay, um, we have also one question on the combination. So if it would make sense to combine uh, motion artifacts methods and uh, for example, uh, doing the TCC GLM, uh, does it make sense to do prior for, to, to the TCC GLM do some correction methods before? Um, that's a good question. Actually, we are doing the correction within the GLM, so it, it's not necessary to have any motion corrections before. I mean, we didn't test uh, doing it, like doing a motion correction before. We we just, um, um, you know, we just uh, have it as a regressor. So I don't know the exact answer, whether it's going to be better or not. Uh, but t technically, because we have it as a regressor, it should be cleaning it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Next question. Um, is there a way of visually assessing the effect of the motion correction algorithm, for example, by comparing corrected and uncorrected data? Um, definitely, but you like you, you need to go back and forth. Um, maybe you're asking whether you can visualize them at the same time. Um, I mean, Right now, like whatever we ha with whatever we have, what we can do is I generally look at optical density before and after correction. For instance, um, I don't know if it's I think this is after correction, but um, so you can you can fix this um, um, 
wide scale, ideally. And then you can go to view and copy plus the figure and you have you know one of these. Uh, I think this was after correction and you can do, um, uh, you can run it again and look at uh, before correction, but maybe you're asking more systemic way of, you know, um, outputting both before and after at the same time. That type of functionality is not there. Uh, but if you're interested in, you should write um, to the Google Earth, I would say. Thank you. I think we will take two more questions. And the next one, does Homer 3 include functions for data quality assessment, global signal regression, and resampling? Um, I think yes, yes, yes. Um, for the pruning, we have the same function um, as uh, in Homer 2. Um, let me quickly show you that. It's, uh, it should be like prune channels or something. Um, yeah, it's this one. I'm just going to add it because uh, so that I can show you. Um, and so it always goes to the first, um, uh, the, like as the first step because it's applied on raw uh, signal. Um, so here you see, um, so it has this uh, range. This is the range for the um, raw signal. So you have to be careful about this. Like if you look at NIREX data, I want to look at raw data. So it, it's you can get these numbers from these guys. Uh, what is the like uh, their range, like their ideal range? Um, definitely these values here uh, are not good, especially like this. If you keep this, it will remove all the channels. So um, I'll put zero here, but uh, you, you need to ask the like the um, um, product specs, like which values will be good um, for this one. But for SNR, you may have an idea. Um, I would recommend like five maybe uh, for this one. This is just looking at uh, the signal to noise ratio of each channel and removing a channel if the that rate uh, that uh, doesn't pass the threshold. And um, and this is a source detector range. Um, so this is if you have you know different um, source detector distances. For instance, if you have channels like six centimeter or so. Um, um, and this is in millimeters, so it will remove um, those channels uh, from your analysis. Um, yeah, so it's doing that. And for global regression, as I said, we have this HMR underscore GLM function, uh, which um, which uh, has the option of using short suppression regression uh, to remove um, uh, remove um, global physiology. Um, we should also have this downsampling function, but I don't see it here. So maybe we didn't uh, carry it here, but that's that's a good point that you raised. Um, we should we had it on Homer too, but uh, we should also have it here. Uh, add this functionality on Homer too as well. We are building a small to-do list for you, Mariam. <laughs> <laughs> So we are already a little bit over time, but uh, we I will do one last question. Maybe one more. Yes. So um, is there any way of automatically detecting the most prevalent type of motion artifact in the data? So for example, sudden movement or baseline shift? And sub-question, what would you advise for group analysis? Should we use the same method for all individuals or check big case by case? Um, yeah, to the first question, um, we typically um, uh, use like 20 for like, I don't know if you recall these, we had two options for uh, motion uh, detection. I, I don't know why I keep closing Homer 3. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, for standard deviation, uh, we generally use like 20 and for amplitude, we use 0 0.05, but as you have seen in our case, we use 0 0.05, and it, it actually like found too many uh, motion, like even at locations that there were no motion artifacts, it found something. So we don't want that. So it's always like you you look at your data, right? You have um, you choose some parameters and you look at your data, 
And to your second question, uh, I would highly suggest that you keep the parameters as well as, of course, the method the same for all subjects, just to be, you know, um, not to be going in the subjective direction. Um, so I will suggest just using, uh, keeping the same thing, but of course, go back to each of your subject data and see if it uh, properly corrected um, the motion artifacts. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miriam. Unfortunately, we are we are over over our time. We cannot uh, answer any more questions now. But again, we will follow up with all questions. And if if our team cannot answer uh, some, we will ask uh, Dr. Miriam directly. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we we'll see you tomorrow then. Thank you. Bye bye.